All right, time to wrap this thing up. We've been through the, the easy parts of creating univariate stats, bivariate stats, and even uh, visualizations in our first MLR. However, automating the MLR so that we don't have to painstakingly go through and try every single combination of variables to see which one gets us the best combination of an R squared versus not having too many variables to overfit. That's that's the harder part. So I've completed my attempt at it. I'm going to show you what I've done. However, know that this is one of many solutions. I'm certainly not doing everything in this example that I could do, but it's probably enough for now and probably even to stretch you if this is where you're at uh, in the course in the book. So let me walk you through my process here. Uh, if you remember in the prior video, we had just finished making um, our first actual MLR. I guess I don't have it up anymore, so I can't show you. But anyway, uh, what I challenged you to do was come up with a function or set of functions that would automate the process of choosing variables. So here's what I've done. I've got uh, one, two, three, clear that out Four functions that I divided each of my steps up into step one two three four then I've got this function that steps through all four of them repeatedly until I've tried every possible combination of variables and then I print out this awesome table right here that shows me exactly uh, over here how many variables are in my model what the R squared R squared adjusted the difference between them other fit metrics that I like shows what those are for this particular combination of variables. And as I remove one variable each time, you can see that I have, uh, you can see the R squared go down very gradually. The R squared goes up for part of the time actually, and then back down again. But all the while it's the difference between them, this column right here, that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's because as we get rid of uh, extraneous variables that don't do much good, if any, to our overall uh, R squared value or in explaining the, the label, R squared adjusted will get higher and closer to what the actual R squared is because it discounts for having too many variables that don't matter. Anyway, eventually we go all the way down here to, as you can see, one variable, or I think that's actually meant to be none, but our R squared goes all the way to zero when we pull out all the variables. And uh, Here's a nice plot of it. I made this chart and I had to adjust the Y axis to make it a little bit easier to understand what's going on because at first what I have here is R squared and R squared adjusted plotted as line charts. Down on the X axis here is the number of variables in the model. Um, too hard to see, they're too similar. So I adjusted the range like that, set the Y limit from 0.88 to 0.921. Now you can really see what happens here. As we remove variables, I'm kind of going backwards, but as we remove them, um, or add them and go in the direction. And again, I'm always removing the worst variable in the last model. That's the tricky part that we got to make sure we do because that, that can change. But anyway, as I remove them, R squared always goes down in an MLR. Uh, that's not true for every um, algorithm, but for MLR it is. And R squared adjusted can actually go up as we remove variables, the worst ones, it gets higher and higher but all the while, even here when it decreases, it's getting closer to the actual R squared score. So eventually, I get to this point right here where you can see, how do I interpret this? My curve stops, and then it's kind of consistent for a while as I remove one variable at a time. So what's happening here is there's no change at all. These are variables that are contributing uh, relatively equally, I guess. And then all of a sudden it drops off again. They get really close together. So what's the right number of variables? Um, I think you could argue anywhere in between right here to maybe down to here, uh, I think is a decent number. But we'll talk at the end of this video on how do you exactly choose where to end up. And it's not a specific, it's not a hard rule, but I'll show you some guidelines. But this is it. This is how I choose. So I, I look at this and say that's about 20 variables at 88% R squared. So let's go look at our table and see what uh, where what are those 20 variables. So here I am, 20 variables left in the model, 88%. Um, that's where I'm at. So how do I find out what those variables are? Well, up in one of my functions, I actually generate a list of what the variables were. I'll get to that point, but that's right here where I say, give me the list of variables in addition to my R squared and everything else. And then I printed it out right here to an external CSV file so I could have the full list with the variables in it. But then I dropped that 
last feature, uh, that, la that last list of variables before I return the data frame out right here. This is the completed data frame of all the one model on each record. It's my model uh, table. Um, so if you want to see that, I, here's the CSV that was generated from this process. And I can scroll down to right here where I have 20 variables and you can see what was in there when it was left. So it's listed in order from least to most effective or useful in terms of its contribution to the R squared. Uh, and that's based on the t-test score. Um, I'll get to that again too. But what we see here is the most important variable is the number of, of uh, square feet on the second floor followed by the number of square feet on the first floor. Well, that makes sense. Interestingly enough, after that, it's do you have clay tile on the roof? That makes sense. Clay tile is expensive. You see a lot of it in uh, Phoenix and or Arizona, California, where they've got a lot of heat, but it costs a lot more. But anyway, then they've got some subjective overall rating of overall quality, number of square feet finished in the basement, condition to, I'm not even sure what that means, year built. That makes sense. Newer homes are sell for more. Uh, kitchen quality. This actually makes sense. So this is kitchen quality rated as excellent. So having a, a really nice kitchen is one of the biggest factors to influencing your price. Uh, that, that actually agrees with common uh, uh, wisdom in that area. Then you can see here we've got some neighborhoods that clearly must have a good brand name, uh, desirable places to move. But what you don't know from this list is which are positive and which are negative coefficients or ne positive or negative t-tests. For example, right here, I know that this one's actually a negative score. If you have a kitchen above the garage, that's actually going to lower your price, which also makes sense. But that has a big effect on the price, so it's up here with this list. So we don't just get the positive coefficient uh, uh, factors here, but um, the negatives too, depending on how far from zero they are. Anyway, uh, so what we want to do next is I want to walk you through my functions so you can see how they work. And then I want to talk about criteria for... All right, we know roughly 20 is where we want, but how do we really then pick? I mean, is 88.2% really that different from 88.5 or 87 point or point, you know, 8, 87.8? Uh, you know, here's my t test. How, why is it for sure that it has to be 20? Well, it's not, um, but there are some other criteria we can use. So let's start by walking through the functions, then we'll come back to that. Here's how it works. So I've got four steps, basically. And it starts here. The first thing I do, I'm going to delete this out of here. I've got this function to just prepare the data and get it ready. Now, you may choose to make your own functions and, uh, differently, to divide up these tasks differently or combine some. This is not a hard and fast rule. That this, this, is, this is just one of many ways to do it. This is how it made sense to me that I did it. I have one function just to clean, uh, create my dummy features and perform the scaling. So you can see here I've got my loop to create the dummies. I'm uh, giving it a prefix, dropping the first, so I don't, uh, I always have n minus one dummies. And here I'm creating a min max scale and I'm returning um, a, a, a scaled version of the data set with dummies. So let me show you what that looks like here. Uh, and let's print out that DF. All right, here we go. All variables, you can see scaled between a zero and one. That's what a min max scale does. Here's all my dummy codes. That's what's generating. Once that's generated and stored, the next step is to run the actual MLR. So here's where I say, all right, pass in that data frame that we just created here by calling MLR prepare. So we call this function, it returns a data frame. Uh, by the way, what I'm passing in here is a data frame object by calling that import housing function that we made a few videos ago to just do the very basic cleaning, pull in the data, fix some column names, drop the ID, drop nulls. That's what that's where that one's coming from. Okay, so uh, I pass in that data frame and I identify what the label is. So when I call this function right here, uh, I'm it, it's going to return a results object from the OLS.fit, which I did all together on one line instead of two separate lines, running creating the OLS object and then calling .fit. But anyway, I uh, pass in a data frame, mark which column is the label, mark the X's, and uh, drop um, by, by dropping the label and assigning the constant right here in my MLR. And this returns a results object. So the results object has all of uh, those properties of a stats models OLS. Parameters, t-test scores, p-values, your r, r-squared, all of those different metrics that come from, from that function. All right, so once that's created, 
I actually come down here to this one, and I think I want to move this one up. This is really step three. So this one says, okay, now you've got the model. Now let's calculate the fit statistics. Pass in the results object. We also need the actual Y, the, the sale price, the column, the pandas series that contains um, the actual values. And then I let them choose what, how, how much they want to round to when they pass that in. But what it's going to generate is, uh, let me show you right here. We call this first of all, so it stores that memory. Um, actually, just so you can see what that does, results dot summary just so you remember oops i forgot the there we go so this is what that generates is this um output with my r squared all my fit statistics all my coefficients and all that so that is what's getting passed on into this next third function right here to generate uh turn fit stats let's call this let's say df features equals MLR fit, pass in results, pass in the actual, which is going to come from that data frame above of sale price. And then I'll just leave the round to set to 10. So let me print this out so you can see. Yeah, so this is what generates my, whoa, easy there, my a list of fit metrics. So notice it's not a data frame. It's a Python list, which contains an R squared, and you can see it getting added in right here. R squared, R squared adjusted, those both came from the results object, already calculated, didn't need to calculate those, I'm just passing them through. Then I get the difference between them, you can see right here, uh, which is an easy calculation. But then I have RMSE, which I calculated using the RMSE formula, which is the squared residuals or the square root of the sum of squared residuals divided by uh, total uh, N. So RMSE, uh, then MAE, again, the formula for that one is right here. But it's all based on information I get from the results object and the actual object, and it returns this nice list. So what do I do with this list? I want to use this list to become an entry in that table that you saw down here. So that list represents one of these entries minus that list of features. So notice I'm returning the entire list of features that went into that model right here. I'm going to clear this back out again. There we go. Um, so the way this one works, uh, it, how does it get that, how does it come up with that, those, those measures in the first place? Well, one thing I had to do was first of all, generate a, uh, um, and actually I should call this not DF features. This is fit metrics list. That's a better name for that thing conceptually. This DF features object, is one that is generated from my fourth function down here, but it's called inside my first function. Let me show you what this one does down here. This one, just you just pass in the results object, which was generated a couple of functions ago. And all it does is it takes these values that were already in that results object previously, the coefficient, the t and the p, but by putting them in a data frame, it allows me to then sort by t value and then p value. I probably don't need to do both because t is detailed enough. Anyway, so the advantage of that is by sorting the data frame with the smallest t test value first, it lets me know which variable I want to kick out of the model after every time I run it. So by running the full model, I get uh, this categorical variable utilities, the group all pub, whatever that means. This has the smallest effect on the overall model. So I need to generate this table so that I can sort it, so that I can identify the worst one, so that I can kick it out and run another model without that one in there. So that's what this one's doing. Um, generates that table. Um, I'm just going to store this somewhere. I don't really need a DF features, I guess. I'll put it there just so it hides and goes away. So this one is what's called up here in MLR model fit to start this process of saying, OK, now uh, we know which feature, um, actually, I may not even need to use that one here necessarily. Do I use DF features anywhere? I may have adjusted it. Oh, no, I do. I only need it for this one thing right here to get a list of all of the features in order with the worst one first. I wanted that list to put into my my uh, my fit table, my, my models table, this one down here. Now, you still don't see that feature list. I'll show you why in a second. OK, so those are my four functions that do every do all the work. This is like my controller function that uses each of them in order. So it starts out, says, okay, 
let's generate our empty data frame, which is going to store all these models down here with these column names. And you can see them up here at the top. There's the column names, including features. Then I say, all right, run that MLR prepare, which gives me the dummy codes and scales. Then I say, run the first MLR. Uh, uh, this is going to be the first of many because there's more down here in this loop. But run the first MLR and then create an entry in this models table below that as the label or the row index label, use the name, use, sorry, use the length of the number of parameters in that model. So this 17, actually this needs to rerun. I'm gonna run that real quick and get that running while I talk. I had to fix it. It actually starts at 216. Anyway, so it puts 216 in there and then it calls model fit to get those fit metrics, which again is this one right up here. So in order, I've called all three of these first three um, and model fit called that fourth one. So I run that one to create a new entry in the table. And then down here, I use that features uh, right here, MLR feature DF, this one. I call that function again, even though it was already used here. I don't pass the results out. So anyway, I have to call it again right here uh, so that I can identify what my least useful feature is. So once I know that on my full model that includes everything, I come down into a loop where I say, okay, make a new data frame where we drop that least important feature. And the way I do it is I say, all right, uh, drop where columns equals, and then I go to my DF features data frame, which is the one that was right here that generated that list of features sorted in order of the least importance to the most. And I say dot index, which refers to the rows, dot zero, meaning give me the index of the first row. So let me remind you why I use that. So let me print this one out again. So right here, what I'm referring to, this data frame, DF results, which is being referred to right here, or sorry, DF features, dot index. Dot index means give me all of these bolded black names right here. See how there's no label, column label? That's because this is the index of the rows, the labeled index, not the numeric index. So I'm saying grab that index, or the list of all those values, and give me zero, the first one in that list. That's how I'm getting utilities all pub is getting passed in right here for that object. So I'm saying drop the first one on that list, which is the worst or least important variable, and then rerun the MLR and put it into a new results object. So here's my results summary. I run another MLR uh, with this new data frame that has now had the worst feature removed. Then recalculate the features table so that I can uh, sort again later or, or, get the, or get the next worst feature after that. And then make an entry in my models table down here. So it makes the entry 215 because this length of results.param after I dropped one, it went down from 216 down to 215. And so that's why it made a new entry in loc 215 and set it equal to the results of the model fit table, where I pass in my results and my actual label and it returns back these one, two, three, four, five, six values, because it includes features too. So I, when that table's done being generated for all 216 models, I'm saving the complete file to the CSV Remember, it's the one that includes this, this features column right here. Once I have it stored in a CSV, I go ahead and I dropped that column features so that I wouldn't see it here because it would make my output, it would print like crazy. It'd be, it'd be complicated. So I drop it before showing it here, knowing that I've got it saved somewhere. All right, that's the walkthrough of how my automation of the modeling process works. Do you have to do this for your exam in my class? Well, it depends on your instructor. For mine, no, you could just manually by hand try all combinations of features and make yourself run 216 models. You could probably shave that down by taking out a few chunks at a time. But here's the disadvantage of that. Let me bring the data and show you back, uh, show this again, why you, why you don't want to take out more than one feature at a time. So here's our first model. Utilities all pub was the worst feature. The second worst was exterior first, whatever that is. Once we take out utilities all pub, if that one doesn't have a big effect, then the second one on the list should be the worst one next time, which it is. But at some point, it may not be. Because as soon as I take out one variable, 
it affects the coefficients for all other variables. Even if it's very, very small, it still changes it. And at some point, one of these that's second on the list will not be the first on the list next time. As you look down through here, I can't remember now off the top of my head, but sure enough, at one point, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, here's an example. Look right here, half bath was the second worst one. Next time, half bath was the first worst one. But look at the second worst one now. It's foundation C block. Previously, the third worst was exterior first, whatever that is. And then when I switch from this model to this model, it should have been foundation C block. It should have been the next worst one on the list. But by removing half bath, it affected all of the other coefficients so much that it actually pushed foundation block back a bit to where this was the next exterior first, WD, whatever that is. That became the worst one next time. That's why we have to do it one at a time. Uh, if we don't, we could end up missing something important and taking out a variable that would have actually been very important had we done it one at a time like this. So you'll see examples of that all through, all through here, where the order of, of variables from least to most important changes every time you take one out. So that leads us back to one of my first questions. We, I said that 20 is probably the model I'd use. Probably is a good word for it. it I, there's not a clear reason for me to choose 20. I could take anything within this range. So what I would do first is I would look at the mo at the variables being removed each time and see if there's one that I think there's a good theoretical reason to think that that variable matters more than it does. So I might look at um, model 15, for example, and say, okay, model 15 had kitchen above garage removed. Oh, I know that matters. People hate kitchen above garage. So you know what? I'm going to keep this model that includes it. I look at this one, garage area, oh, totally. Uh, I know people that need to have more garage areas, so I'm going to include that one. Neighborhood Stonebrook. Um, yeah, that one's kind of a name brand neighborhood. People like it, so I'm going to include that one. And I might eventually get to some place like, okay, building type townhouse E. You know what? I think something's wrong because nobody wants townhomes, and I think we just happen to get a bunch of townhome, townhouse E's in our data set that were really expensive. I don't think that one makes theoretical sense. I'm going to go back to model 23, if functional type, whatever that means, if that's the last one that I thought really had a good theoretical reason to matter in my model. That is my first criteria when it comes to deciphering among the 10 or 20 or so models that are all kind of similar to each other. So let's say you don't have that. All right, we went to model 20, uh, exterior quality of whatever that is anyway. Let's say this is the one, uh, I don't really have a good theoretical reason to go beyond this one. What I'm going to do next, I say, all right, well, should it be 20 then? Or should it be model somewhere between 20 and 10? Should I cut it back even further and take my R squared from 88% all the way down to 84? 4% R squared when I'm already at 88 is not a terrible loss if Let's say I don't have a good theoretical reason for these, which, sorry, before I said I did, so I guess I should be arguing in this direction. So I don't have a theoretical reason to go further, um, but, you know, I'm going to kind of check, I might check still five models in both direction, before and after model 20, and see if I can come up with anything. So here's what I would do next. I'm looking at, uh, not necessarily the t-test, but this is when I want to go back to, I'm going to minimize this a bit and highlight these over here so I can remember them. This is when I'm going to go back to my bivariate stats. Remember when I said, you'll see later why it's important that we do these. Okay, so I'm going to keep this here so I can see the variable that was removed in each one of those models. What I want to do now, put that there, and I'm going to scroll up, and I'm going to find those in my bivariate stats. Well, maybe I should have ordered these alphabetically here instead of that way. Um, Actually, that's not the one I want. I think what I want... Um, oh, by the way, this is sort of interesting. Overall quality was the number one before, and it still turned out to be the number one. So that, uh, when it was a, analyzed as a bivariate stat, it had the biggest effect size for numeric variables. But number two was not total square feet. It was all the way down to first floor square feet and second floor square feet. So see how... When you run bivariate stats, you're not getting a totally accurate picture because it's not accounting for the intercorrelation among all these variables. Anyway, I'm going to skip all these and let's go back up. 
actually, I think, to univariate first. What I'm looking for is I want to find out if I've got any skewness or kurtosis problems with some of these variables that I'm considering keeping. So remember, this one right here was the model I've been thinking of that I think I like. And let me stretch this out a bit. And that is exterior quality GD, whatever that is. So let's search for it on here. I'm going to go find, um, let me move this down so you can see it. Find uh, exterior, no, ext, uh, was it qual? Oh, shoot, I better pull it up. Um, exter qual TA. Exter qual TA. Oh, it's not finding. Oh, there we go. All the way down here. So that was a. That was a text, a categorical field. It does have a significant effect right here, according to that, but I don't get any, um, I don't have any metric about like skewness or kurtosis that's telling me that I have a problem there. So let me go back now and see if I have any numeric variables in this range that are giving me problems like garage area or kitchen above garage. Let's go find those two. So they're going to be up here somewhere. So let's search for kitchen above. Oh, it doesn't like that one, huh? Oh, here we go. Kitchen above garage. So let's take a look at this. Skewness. Yes, I've got a major skewness problem with that one. And kurtosis problem. That one seems to matter, but it worries me a bit. So... If I can't fix that skewness, and I haven't taught you how to do that yet, but if I, I may be able to fix that skewness, but if I can't, I might decide, you know what, this kitchen above garage model, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick out kitchen above garage instead of some of these others. And I might make a new model that includes all of these, but not kitchen above garage or something like that. I could still take that one out right there. Same thing with garage area. I would then look at all these, these, uh, numeric variables. Let's see, do I have garage area in here? Here it is. Do I have any problems with that one? No, that one actually looks good. So that one's a keeper. So here's my model and I'm just going to go through and just keep checking all of my, let me pull this over here a bit. Eh, I need to be too hard to, can't really move it. But I'm going to go through and just check all of these. Uh, I can tell it's categorical because I've got my little underscore here for a dummy code. But all these numeric ones for sure. Lot area, overall condition. Let's see what those ones look like in your build. So garage area. This one, that one's fine. Overall quality, that one's fine. Your built, I bet that one's going to be a problem. Oh, well, maybe not. You're sold, you're built. Yeah, no, that one's fine. Well, oh, I see it's negative a bit, but it's it's within plus or minus one, so that one's fine too. So based on this, I think um, I would go ahead and kick out kitchen above garage. That one had a major skewness problem. Garage area was fine. Lot area was fine. Or did I check lot area? Can't remember now. Lot area. Oh, major problem. I might want to pull out lot area. So it could be argued that if I'm pulling those ones out, uh, maybe I just pull them out up at the beginning because of their skewness problems. But then at the same time, I could argue the other way. I mean, they clearly matter a lot. They have a huge effect. Do I just instead say that, okay, well, for lot area, here's the other thing I could do. I could say, well, you know what? I'm going to leave it in anyway, but I'm going to put in some rules. So here's a set of rules for this model. Uh, let me go down here to the, the diagram for lot area, so you can see. Where is it? Oh, I'm skipping my diagram. Uh, okay, let's see how hard it is to find year sold, month sold. I'll pause it while I find. It. All right, here's my lot area. Check this out. This is why I do the bivariate stats. All of my lot areas are all right here. Clearly, I have some outliers that are pulling my line over there. What if I get someone, I get some new data that has a lot that's 150,000 square feet, which is right here. How much do you trust that it's going to be right there? 
I don't trust it very much. It's so skewed. Really, what I should have is a line that goes almost straight through there at a really steep angle. So since we haven't taught you data cleaning yet, I would probably go ahead and kick this one out of the model. Now, that's not what I would do every single time. Um, yeah, I, I don't tr trust that prediction at all because of that skew those outliers there. But let's find one that is skewed, but that I might keep. So here, no, that skewness is fine. Let's find one where it's a little bit off. Okay, here we go. Sales price. Sales price is, well, that's our label. That's not going to help for my example. Uh, no, not that one either. Let's find another one. Okay, here we go. Basement finished square feet. There's still some skewness going on here. See how it's all centered around here? This one, I do kind of see that there is an upward trend though. So the, the, the line goes this way. I don't think these two outliers are pulling it too terribly bad. I think I kind of trust this. And a way to find out for sure is to change this plot to a hex plot instead to see just how dense some of those are in there. But in this case, what I would do is I would say, uh, yes, we're including basement finished square feet in our model, which I think it is in the model of that um, of that one. Is that in there? Basement. Yeah, right there. There it is. So we're including that one in our model. However, based on this, we're going to say that our prediction is only valid between 0 and maybe 1,800 square feet. So if a data set comes in that has a basement square finished basement square feet above 1,800, we're going to run a different model that doesn't include a basement finished square feet. That's how you can handle it um, if you weren't able to fix it. So depending on your instructor and what your midterm looks like, if you're taking my midterm, that would be, uh, I'm, I'm going to ask you to run uh, a bunch of models just like this on a totally different data set and then justify which features you put in the model. And I'm going to know if they've got skewness issues uh, or if there's heteroscedasticity issues, which is related, really comes back to skewness. So you'll want to explain why you kept each variable in the model uh, based on a combination of factors. One, did it show up down here? Uh, was it... Did you pick your model first based on um, on this curve down here? So this is how I first got to my model of about 20 variables being the one that I like somewhere around here. Once you chose that, then I got to go in and look at the individual variables and see are there any issues with normality um, that would justify either taking the variable out and then rerunning the model without that one. Um, or if I leave it in, I've got to explain why what values i think my prediction would be value uh, valid within anyway hope this helps in understanding everything we've done so far and why we've done it all and how we use it and come to some conclusions based on this i am going to recommend a model using these variables with some limitations on the lot area variable for what i'm willing to uh, what what values i'm willing to make predictions around and I can take that knowledge and the parameters for each of these variables, and I can build it into some sort of machine learning product. For example, if uh, if this were me, I would, and I was running a website like um, Zillow. Uh, let's just pick something. Current uh, allow? Why not? All right. So here I live somewhere in this area. What I would do is I would use it. The way Zillow is using it is you click on a house, any house, and they have this Zestimate score, this predicted value. So that NLR that you just came up with is being used to generate this. Shoot, it might even be better than this. If you had data for this area, uh, you could, depending on how good your data was, you could potentially get a more accurate Zestimate than they've got on here. But that's how you productize uh, an, an NLR or a... Or a some sort of multivariate analysis. Uh, and we call that machine learning uh, with a few more steps. We haven't gotten we haven't gotten there yet. But in machine learning, we do a few more little things to tweak our process to make it more likely to adapt well to new houses or new data. But essentially, we're halfway there because you get at this point, uh, we've covered at least in the class how to use those coefficient weights to come up with a prediction in real numbers. And this is a perfect example for this data set of how to productize. So um, the Zillow 
get used more than one of its competitors because it has this cool estimate score right here, possibly. Um, but that's one of the hot areas right now in technology is to build these types of data products into our applications um, to try and add value for customers. All right, hope you enjoyed this video.